now. Again, thank you for joining us. And now today, we'll turn the time over to today's presenters. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Will Blakely. I am a program associate with Children and Family Futures, and I would just like to invite our other presenters to introduce themselves as well. Shirsten. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Shirsten Freskin. I'm a senior program associate with Children and Family Futures. Judge Forstar. My name is Stacy Forstar. I'm the chief judge for the Fort Peck Center of Buenos Tribes, located in Montana. Judge Carroll. Good afternoon. My name is Carrie Garo. I'm Mohawk from Akwesasne, and I am the chief judge of the St. Regis Mohawk Tribal Court and also over the Healy Duomas Court. Great, thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Today we are going to be talking about the Family Treatment Court best practice standards. And specifically, we're gonna be reviewing how they are being used by Healing to Wellness Courts. So we're going to be providing a brief overview of what the standards are, and then a little bit of information about each individual standard before Judge Forstar and Judge Garo discuss how they are using them in their family treatment courts. Next slide. We just want to acknowledge and thank the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention who funds and supports the work that Children and Family Futures is doing in, these, in this presentation. Our mission at Children and Family Futures is that Children and Family Futures strives to prevent child abuse and neglect while improving safety, permanency, well-being, and recovery outcomes with equity for all children, parents, and families affected by trauma, substance use, and mental health disorders. Within Children and Family Futures, we run a number of different programs. Shearson and I both work directly with the National Family Treatment Court Training and Technical Assistance Program, but we also have a few other programs, including the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare, the START Program, and QUIC, or the National Quality Improvement Center for Collaborative Court Teams. So we're involved in a number of different um, training and technical assistance support for programs, agencies, departments, collaboratives, working with families in the substance use and child welfare programs. Um, but we are specifically with the Family Treatment Court program. Thank you. So what are the Family Treatment Court best practices? These are all practice-informed, research and data-driven. They're multidisciplinary, multi-systemic, including child welfare, substance use disorder treatment, um, mental health treatment, and a number of other different programs um, working with child welfare and different program improvement, implementation, and operations. Um, we make sure that these, that these practices are all culturally relevant, focused on the children and the family. They're trauma responsive, community-based, and specific to the communities that they are serving. And so, next slide, please. So the, the Family Treatment Court best practice standards provide guidance for how a family treatment court can run. We know that they are research-based. This is some of the best work that we can be doing, but it's not a detailed step-by-step -step guide. Um, it's, it's more of guidelines that we encourage family treatment courts to follow. And, and, and we know that to do all of the things that are included is, is incredibly difficult for any, any family treatment court. So these are some of the guidelines that we encourage and we try to guide people along. So how the Family Treatment Course Best Practice Standards are set up, um, and I just wanna point out that I have my copy here um, and I am able to reference at any point in time, I find myself daily looking in it um, for, for examples or for some guidance when I'm trying to figure out the right way to respond to a challenge. Um, but we wanted to just discuss real quickly that each standard is set up that there's first a description and then provisions within that standard. And so we're going to be discussing a number of provisions today. Then there's the rationale or the, the research, the application behind it. And then some key considerations that we encourage family treatment courts to think about. 
And then at the end, there's references, some, some data that's, that's driving these standards. So for a quick overview, we have this, this example of a house. At the bottom, we have the, the, the foundation, the organization and structure of the best practice standards and of the family treatment court. So we know that, that family treatment courts need this strong foundation on which they can build the rest of their family treatment court. Overseeing at the top is the monitoring and evaluation. We need to be collecting data. We need to be looking at, is what we're doing working? And if, are there ways that we can improve our processes? And then we have the other standards within there. Role of the judge, equity and inclusion, early screening and assessment, timely, high quality treatment, case management, and those therapeutic behavior responses. We also know, and we're working on trying how to depict this best, but we know that equity and inclusion really need to be woven in throughout each of these other standards um, in order to make sure that we are really doing the best job that we can serving the families that we serve. We also know that no single agency can do all of this alone. It really does take the entire collaborative. This isn't simply a project or a program or a court centric entity. This isn't just child welfare or substance use disorder. It really is the collaborative effort of all of the different partners within the family treatment court that are able to meet the needs of these families. So we, we just thank everybody that's here and all the work that you are doing because um, it does, it takes everyone. We also know that these work. A meta-analysis of 16 evaluations looked at outcomes from family treatment courts, and they learned that participants were twice as likely, more than twice as likely, to reunify with their children than those parents, families that went in a regular track. So these are research-based. We know these work, and here's some of the guidelines for how they can work. So I think with that, we're going to kick it off to Shearston who's gonna talk about standard one. Thanks so much, Will. So I understand uh, during the plenary today that many of, many of the folks uh, participating in the conference um, are in the process of planning or maybe early implementation of a family healing to wellness treatment court. Um, if that's the case, I really want to direct you to spend more time with this very first standard, organization and structure. This is really the foundational principles. Um, go ahead, Marlon, and next for me. Each of these really lays out some of the core aspects that we need to have in place to have that strong foundation for that really excellent family healing to wellness um, treatment court. And so if, if you're just getting started, I would say spend more of your time here initially. Um, I would also direct you to um, our planning guide. The family treatment court planning guide is, has a lot of wonderful resources to take you through many of these things, figuring out who needs to be on your team, um, understanding what that governance structure should look like and who needs to be in that governance structure. Um, it has exercises for a shared mission and vision and some of these other pieces. So I, this is a great spot to start. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it to our, um, our two judges and Judge Forrestar, could you talk a little bit about your experience um, interacting with the, the elements that are here in standard one. Thanks, Kristen. So organization and structure, if you are to plan stages, this is the most important part is to when your tribe, your community, maybe not the partnerships, who is going to be part of this team, and looking at what resources you have, the resources, um, what source page, reference guide for other team members that come on, and establishing those support systems, whether they are 
with the entities or, or whether they, as COVID has been services, you might find those through the web. Looking at the division, what is it that you are focusing on? You might have a healing family, you might have a juvenile, and you might have an adult court that you are going to develop is going to determine and what type of services and resources they are. And the pre-courts staffing, once you have everything with your, you're gonna find out as you go through staffing and, and as you start that you make changes and the, utilizing your staffing as part of your growing, your court. And those, those review hearings for Fort Peck, ours is family based on how that we're starting but we have focused on the reunification portion of it and you can integrate those cultural components in it too as well. Uh, there's a trauma informed. That's where we found that we were. Judge Four Star, we're, I was gonna say, we're losing a lot of what you're yes. sharing. Are you calling in at this point? I'm not sure what. It's a little better with your camera off. Ah, uh, the Up joys in. of technology. Okay, I will turn the camera off. And sorry, I had just finished talking. Maybe. Judge Garo? Yeah, Judge Garo. Sure. Um, so I, it, and I'm sorry, Judge Forstar, you're breaking uh, a, a little for, for me as well. I, I, I thought I heard you talking about the pre-court staffing and, and court review hearing, which um, is so critical and really why we do Healing to Wellness Court. For, for some judges, that's difficult attending, uh, a difficult change for them attending a pre-court staffing and they have concerns about ethics but it's so critical. And if you are concerned about your tribal ethical rules, you can always change them if you don't have a therapeutic um, court exception uh, to allow for ex parte uh, hearings, um, or you can have it in your consent uh, forms uh, or your contract. Uh, but it's so critical because as a judge, that's where I become informed. And we talk a lot of strategy um, usually I ask my team, you know, what is it you want me to talk to this participant about today? Um, we'll also do, um, some planning, you know, okay, I'm going to talk to the participant about this and then I'll ask our case manager to, to follow up or, uh, to focus on something else that perhaps I'm not focusing on. Um, sometimes we'll in the, in the pre-court staffing, we'll select things that, maybe the judge needs to talk about, but other things that come better from our case manager. Um, and that's so important for the judge to be there because otherwise it's really no different than, than, than regular court and uh, you're, not, you're really not helping the participants um, and, and giving the, them the full service um, uh, that, that you can provide to them by just being and listening in the pre-court staffing. And did you want me to talk talk about any of the others or you want me to move on? If you'd like to address any of the others, otherwise we can go ahead and shift to the, the role of the judge, which I think you were just starting to, to discuss actually. Okay, I'll just a quick note on the, the partnerships is for those of the teams out there who are um, uh, getting, working on developing their, their family treatment courts, you, it's so good to sit down and do a little uh, community mapping to figure out what resources you have available. And that's something we constantly address. We've had people come ask to be team members and we talk about it on the team. Um, we've sometimes we've said no because they've introduced a new concept and we've said that's that's not in our organization and structure right now. It's not in our policies and procedures. And so we don't, we don't have a way to to bring you on, on board, but it's something we'll will consider. Um, and so, so it's really good to think about, and of course, um, uh, do, do an MOU um, about how uh, you will collaborate. 
Okay. Thanks, Judge. Mm -hmm. uh, Marlon, if you could go ahead and forward it for us. And again. So the role of the judge, um, which I think uh, Judge Garo was was really starting to talk about there and in, in, in part talking about that shift to having the judge there in a pre-court staffing. Um, standard two role of the judge is the shortest, those of you who are our judges out there, referees, um, this is the shortest standard. It was written by judges for judges. Um, and so if you have not had a chance to dig into that, I really do recommend that you um, just take a, just a few minutes. It won't take long to get through there. And what is interesting, we were doing a training yesterday and talking about all the research tells us is that the, the relationship between the participant and the, and the judge is critical. That relationship is so critical in in that in moving that participant. Ah, see, that's what you don't do. Uh, in moving that participant um, uh, forward in their recovery, and so really paying attention to some of these pieces. Um, next, please. That are discussed here in terms of training and your interaction, participation in that pre-court staffing, um, and length of assignment to the FTC. And I don't know that we're going to talk about this today, but really that role as a convener is so critical because when a judge asks people to come to a meeting, people tend to come. Um, and that's often what we need. As Will said, this is a collaborative practice. Um, so I don't know, um, I know we are going to go to Judge Garo first, but can we see if we can go to Judge Four Star and see if her audio is back up at this point? Yes, I called in on the phone. Thank you. Okay. Um, Judge, do you want to take a few minutes and respond? For the role of the judge? Sure since we lost you on the last one. Okay, so the interaction with the participants is what I found as the presiding of the Healing to Wellness Court is very important to have that connection with the participants and to be, to be able to show them the compassion and empathy that you have and that you have an understanding of what they're going through and being able to um, offer that support. One thing that I would look out for is making sure that that interaction doesn't go beyond the courtroom. Um, the coordinators and case managers, the uh, resources that you'll be utilizing will have a more intimate relationship and you just don't want to cross the line where the participants are relying solely on you as a judge. But once you make that connection, you'll see that the participants are uh, they love to be recognized, and when they are given just simple verbal appraises and having that, um, that feeling that somebody cares for them. And the professional training, this is such an ongoing important piece, is to keep your staff and any training that you can find to send it out to them. Um, even if it's not in your area, we like to give all of our team members the opportunity to continue those, those professional trainings. Um, as we'll go along with the standards, you'll see some of those important items that you as a judge should always continue to keep educating yourself. Judge Gar? So, and I'll just pick up on the professional training. It, it's so important. So I went to my first training of trainers for Healing to Wellness Court in 2000. I was 10. Um, and uh, they, you know, the stuff they taught us to do back in 2000 uh, is stuff they tell us not to do now. So things, things, not, not everything, uh, but things change. You get the, you know, there's a lot more research than there was in 2000. Um, and so, so it's so important. And for me, that's also where you create a bond with your team that then becomes important when you're talking about your participants. I mean, we have 
many a story about our travel experiences um, and getting caught, you know, in layovers or wonderful restaurants we've been to or celebrating birthdays um, that, you know, when then we have to um, perhaps maybe have a, a discussion, a hard discussion about uh, something that's going on in the team, it, it makes it easier. And just to, to finish off, when talking about the interaction with the participants, so it's one of the key um, components um, of when you're interacting with the participants, as much as we're tempted, and I think a lot of us who are you know, trained as judges, we like to talk, it is do not talk. It's very tempting to, because you want to relate to them and show that you relate to them, that you want to share your stories. Um, some of the best training I've had at professional trainings um, has been like motivational interviewing for judges um, and, and, and learning how to be on the bench and interact with participants by listening. Um, and actually, I've been doing some research on indigenous leadership, and one of the, the key components with that is listening, as opposed to we think of Western leaders, they talk a lot, <laughs> some of them anyways. Um, and so, so it's so important. Um, and, and each participant is different. I've had some experiences, some of you have heard me share, where I've said something that was just didn't mean anything to me. You know, I was actually doing what I learned was trying to ask an open-ended question and the participant took offense by some words I had used, which I thought were innocuous. Um, I've also had an experience where a participant came in very angry and I did not know it um, because she entered the courtroom before I got on the bench. And, but because of the way I interacted with her, the team told me afterwards how she just calmed right down. And I wasn't doing that on purpose. I was just doing my regular, you know, how was your week and, and, and what's going on and, and just let her, her have a chance to, to, to say her piece. So that interaction is so uh, important to the participants. Next slide, please. And again, our next standard, standard three, is ensuring equity and inclusion. Um, and so as you'll notice in this standard, it's assessing its operations of the Family Treatment Court and those of partner organizations. So as we said, it is a collaborative. And one of the great benefits of having the three-tiered governance structure that's covered in standard one, organization and structure, is that the Family Treatment Court is able to influence the entire system. So we think of Family Treatment Courts as a part of the system and not apart from the system. And so as we're able to look at the data that we're collecting and we're able to understand how our families are affected, we want to make sure that families of, are not affected disproportionately. So we want to take a look at lots of different points as, as families are in our community, as they are entering the child welfare system, as are being referred to our family treatment court and other treatment services, and then as, as they are successfully completing or moving through our program. Um, and so there's lots of different opportunities to, to look at what is, who is involved in our family treatment court and making sure that we're proportionately impacting those families. Next slide. So we have a number of different things that, we, that we're gonna be looking at when we talk about equity and inclusion. Again, we wanna look at who is in our program, who is, is being admitted, and then who, how the outcomes are looking, making sure that we're impacting each family appropriately, making sure that we have treatment that is culturally responsive and relevant to families, and that we're providing responses that are fair and balanced, responding appropriately to parents that are at similar levels of care similar times in the family treatment court. And one of the things that is interesting about standard three is that it also includes some information about ICWA and making sure that we're engaging with local tribes and making sure that there's representation involved with our family treatment courts. So with that, I wanna send it over to Judge Forstar with any thoughts that she has on standard three.
the treatment that you'll be providing providing for them and to them as the participants in the court, being able to respond to them in a manner that is fair, but it also is structured so that if you are uh, sanctioning or incenti incentivizing that you're doing it on the program that you have created rather than it, and it's different in every court. Some courts will have a person come up and if they're going to be sanctioned, they do it in front of everybody. Other courts may do it as a one-on-one -on -one, and you're going to see how your participants react to it. And as Judge Garo said, there are participants, you don't know what has happened before they've walked in front of you or what's going on in their lives and being able to keep them calm and keep them engaged with you and based off whether their behavior is appropriate or not, taking them aside, but how those responses are. If you treat one different than the others, all the clients are going to pick up on that. The participants are going to feel singled out. They may feel that uh, you're picking on them, but keeping your responses across the board based off whatever their behavior is. What, and if you're incentivizing, make sure that you're doing it on a consistent basis for what completion or what um, they have uh, done as far as being able to deserve that incentive. And with the sanctions as well, having that up front so they know these are the things that you're going to be sanctioned for creates the environment where they know what is going to be expected of them. And if they don't do that, they know what the repercussions are. And if you change it up, you'll notice that your participants, um, if they come in and they don't know what is going to happen to them, it creates anxiety and stress that if your team is able to talk to them and let them know that if this behavior is going to have this reaction. And the retention rates and child welfare outcomes for our wellness court, this is very important because we work with social services and utilizing the case plan or the service treatment agreement into your task sheets or what you have your clients doing is very important to make sure that they don't feel like they are doing double or triple work and that they're getting credit for everything that they're doing with all of the agencies involved. Judge Gar? Thank you, Judge. Um, uh, so many thoughts uh, jumping around my head listening to, to Judge Forstar. I, I think I'll start with the, um, the equitable responses uh, to, to follow up. Um, our participants, they're very smart. They, they watch each other, what's going on. Um, we, this is pre-pandemic, we instituted, which we had learned from another Healing to Wellness Court, we implemented a a box, some people call it a fishbowl, we only had a box, um, where we just put, you know, little like soaps, we had sweet grass or essential oils and snacks. And if you had a successful week um, and had done everything you were supposed to that week, you know, got in all your meetings and all your appointments and anything that perhaps I asked them to do, um, then you were allowed to draw something out of the box if you wanted to. The majority of our participants, when we first introduced it, I mean, we didn't really think that much out of it, but then um, we heard some of our, uh, or I didn't, but our, our either our coordinator or our case uh, manager heard them talking about it, like being very disappointed if they weren't able to um, to to draw out of the box. But it, but it it brought home the importance of, you know, we made sure it was clear, you know, why you couldn't this week, and we started to to take that into account and be very. Uh, careful that we didn't let anyone sneak by like oh yeah you had a good week you can get something out of the box when they didn't to make sure everybody was treated uh, uh, fairly uh, and it's also important to have in your policies and procedures you know how you deal um, with certain in infractions or first time um, um, because then you can fall back on and the way we do it is to keep track of it although we're we're a very small court and so one would hope we'd have good enough memory, but chances are we might not, um, as our coordinator and our case manager um, keeps track of. And we, we, when, we were, when we were in person, we got a, a sheet 
um, you know, that I take up on the bench with me that says where, what phase they're in, what sanctions they've had so far, uh, when they tested positive. So if I need to, at you know, a drop of a hat, I can refer to it. And it's also very helpful when we talk about it. Um, when we are doing it, so we're still virtual. Um, we, the, our coordinator and case manager still keep track of it. We just might not have the, the papers in, in front of us. And I think that that helps us make sure that we stay on track and remember, you know, oh, this is when someone got a, an, a sanction or this is when a person received an incentive. And I think that's, incredibly important. As for retention, um, so our participants are referred to us by the county family court. Um, so we work with the outside jurisdiction. And sometimes we get our people late, which I know is, a, is another area. We'll I'll talk about it more. Um, but we retain our people better. Um, we've had a couple, uh, at least one participant I can think of. I think we've had another um, that uh, didn't have their children removed yet. And, and that helps us uh, retain our, our people longer and get them through and graduated. Great, thank you, Judge. Um, and as you just alluded to, one of the important pieces is getting people in, identifying them as quickly as possible, having a validated assessment tool and a process to get referrals and get people into your family treatment court, your healing to wellness court as quickly as possible. We know that the sooner we get people in, the longer, the better outcomes there will be. And so the quicker we can get people into substance use disorder treatment, the better off their long-term outcome will be, the more likely they are to successfully reunify with their children. And so there's a number of, of different factors in this. And, and as Judge Garrow just talked about, when we talk about different referral bases, different pieces like that, it becomes a little bit tricky to get these families identified as quickly as possible. And so going back to, to uh, our organization structure in standard one, having that clear governance structure that can help with this process, making sure that it's systemic and not based on any sort of objective criteria, like a certain social worker thinking that family treatment court is great, so they're going to refer all of their clients there, or a certain social worker not thinking that it's as great, so they never send referrals. We really want to make sure that it's something that is consistent, that every participant is getting an equal chance to participate in the family treatment court. Next slide. So we again, we want to make sure that we have a clear target population, objective eligibility criteria, standardized process, and making sure that we're removing any barriers that we can. So I think for this one, we'll go ahead and start again with you, Judge Garo. Great, thank you. Um, so I just uh, wanted to know on the objective eligibility um, is that it's very easy, especially, you know, and I've visited some small courts like ourselves, you know, everybody, everybody on your team knows everybody. Uh, they, a lot of these people have been in and out of treatment in and out of the child welfare system. And, and it's can be very easy um, to say, oh, that person won't won't comply, won't. Um, we have a great example of in our adult uh, healing to wellness where a person we were skeptical uh, came in and, and, and she did well and, and graduated. So it's so important um, to just, we, we have our, um, our, our screening and assessment and um, if, if they have substance use disorder, um, and there's no other reason to screen them out because perhaps we can't um, provide, we don't have the services for them. Uh, uh, we, we accept them um, and, and set any sort of our, our doubt, doubts aside. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important um, and getting them and screening them in quickly. It, it's different for those of you who already are doing adult uh, healing to wellness court. It's different when we talk about high risk, low risk, because in, in families, the risk isn't that you're gonna commit another crime, hopefully, although sometimes they come to you and they do have a, a criminal case, um, but you're looking at um, you know, the risk to the child and the risk that the, they're going to continue using or, or not finish a, a treatment. Um, but uh, uh, it's, so it's a little bit different and you're, you're really looking at, um, we uh, have learned 
Um, and it also says that's in the best practices that um, you can separate your, your high risk and low risk into the separate dockets because you don't want your low risk people learning things from your high risk people, which uh, we've experienced. And so I would encourage you to, to separate them out. And, and for us, it's easy because we have relatively a small number. Um, and so I think I'll stop there and uh, let Jeff more stuff. Judge Forster, is there anything that you'd like to add about early screening identification and assessment? Yes, I'm sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so part of your eligibility and your exclusion criteria, that will come along in part of your planning stages, but you may find out down the road that you may want to focus on other groups. And so our family, Healing to Wellness Court is primarily focused on reunification of families. So we get a lot of referrals from family court that are involved with social service agencies. But we also take referrals from criminal court and those are um, adults that have been charged with crimes against children. And they may be a referral from the prosecutor. They may be a self-referral. We've opened it up to those as well because we've seen other custody issues where they want help. So in that sense, if they're a self-referral, we struggled with, okay, so what are we going to do as far as holding them accountable? They don't have a criminal case. They don't have a family court case. So we have them agree to it. So they agree that this is what the handbook entails. This is what you agree to do as a participant. And you agree that if you shall be sanctioned, it would be the same as any other participant that is in there. And with the Screening and referral process, utilizing free tools for uh, screening assessments is helpful, but also looking at other things such as we found that we needed some type of tool to assess, uh, can a person, do they have literacy issues? Is there a learning disability? And those are things that we didn't take into account through our planning process, but that we have encountered and tried to find ways to work around those uh, limitations that a participant has. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, if you could advance, please. And again. So standard five is, uh, uh, one more back, please. Sorry. Standard five, timely, high quality and appropriate substance use disorder treatment. Um, I would say that if you're going to get overwhelmed, you might get overwhelmed in standards five and six. There's a lot in both of these, and there's a lot that um, is really rooted in evidence-based programs, evidence-based um, screenings, all of these kind of, uh, kinds of things. And um, that can feel like a lot if you are in a rural area, if you um, don't have some of the same resources. Um, I would say that if anything coming out of um, COVID and this time of COVID, we have really learned how to use teleservices. Um, we've learned how to use telehealth. We've learned how to use um, virtual therapies and virtual support groups and all of those kinds of things. And so um, if anything, you know, this was a place that probably many of you were leading the way and, um, and some of our other, you know, our cities and our suburban areas and other places, we kind of looked to some of the lessons uh, learned. Um, and so this is a spot that we suggest you kind of uh, look through, spend some time with and really think about how can we best meet the needs of the individuals, the parents, the children, and the families that we work with um, next within the resources that you have. And if you don't have those resources, um, the next slide, please. If you don't have those resources to, to um, go ahead and work with um, your communities through that governance structure and through that uh, resource mapping process to figure out how can we meet some of these um, 
best practices um, for family-centered treatment, gender responsive, um, culturally responsive treatment. And with that, I am going to ask Judge Forstar um, to go ahead and um, talk a little bit more about this. So with the co-occurring substance and mental health disorders, uh, for, for our court, a lot of that wasn't brought to our attention until we had sent them to inpatient treatment. And once they come back with their discharge summary and they have the diagnosis, and then we're following up with the local providers. So having mental health or behavior health as part of your team uh, is vital to that portion of it. Because if we're treating the substance abuse, but we're not focusing on the mental health portion of it, we're gonna defeat the purpose. So in back again, in part of your planning stages, that might be something that you wanna take into consideration upfront to be able to find those resources and services. For the culturally responsive treatment, um, what we have found is our tribe is, it consists of two separate, um, two separate tribes that are similar, but not. So being culturally aware and having our clients self-identify to give us information on what they know, what they want to know, and, and where we need to fill in the gaps with our cultural responsiveness. And also having the training ourselves so that we are understanding and respectful of what it is that they consider as a participant to be uh, their cultural values and their needs. And the medication assistant treatment, there are a lot of grants out there right now for MAP programs. Uh, we do have one here. and. Some of that took an educational portion of it, not only for us as the treatment court and not only for the clients, but for the people in the communities, for our tribal leaders, uh, because they didn't quite get why are we giving them another substance when they're already struggling. So if you're going to have a MAT program, make sure that everybody is on board with you and that everybody understands what, what the purpose of it is. And utilizing that we have seen some of our clients take to it some of it some of them don't and being able to monitor that that you have the the resources to monitor it through drug testing or what that would require you to fill in for it, uh, searching for those those resources that you can effectively monitor them on the map program and what type of money that's going to take judge gar Thank you. I wanted to, to emphasize, like Judge Forsar uh, mentioned, is the importance of um, uh, co-occurring um, treatment. And we're very fortunate. We have a, a tribal uh, substance abuse treatment program and tribal mental health, and they're both members of our team. And, and what we found with our participants is that, and because most of our participants are coming from other courts. Um, so they'll often get referred um, to go get a mental health assessment, um, often by uh, our, our treatment uh, providers. But if the, the orders aren't, if their case plan or their court orders aren't super specific coming from county court, and there's a little wiggle room if they decide they don't want to do mental health uh, uh, treatment um, or counseling, then, then, it, then it's hard to, to, to hold their feet to the fire and encourage them to do that. And then we find they don't do as well. Uh, we have um, several people who um, have relapsed, um, even if they, they've graduated um, and to, you know, one of them, you know, she's back with us. She's not in our, she's in our adult uh, healing to wellness. Um, and, you know, my thought is one of, the, one of the reasons is, is not having really addressed some of the, the trauma and mental health issues. So it, it's so important. Um, and our, um, uh, our treatment, um, uh, people, they, they have a traditional person. We also have um, our traditional uh, support worker who's part of our division of social services. And she does a lot of programs for kids and families. Uh, and, and she's great, you know, we're always like this person is, we always ask her, this person is struggling with grief or, or this issue or that issue, and is there something you can do uh, to, to, to help that person? Um, and, and she's uh, phenomenal and she's able to do that. 
and, and that is very helpful to our participants. Thanks so much. Um, next, please. So standard six, comprehensive case management services and supports for families. This is the biggest standard. It's a lot. Um, it's a whole lot. And um, I really do recommend when we'll put up at the beginning, like you can just take the, the standard, you can just read the provisions. Um, I suggest doing that for particularly standards five and um, six, because it can, it can feel like a lot once you start getting in there. And then as you have questions, as you want to dig more deeply into some of these services. Um, next slide, please. Um, as you want to dig more deeply into some of these services that are discussed in standard six, that's when I would really suggest that you get in, uh, kind of dig into the, the research, which is in the rationale and in the um, kind of key considerations, talking about those practice things. Um, we've, we've highlighted a few here and every bit of this is important, um, but those are some really, uh, what Judge Garo was just talking about, I think is a really nice lead into this intensive case management and, and also Judge Forstar, um, intensive case management and coordinated case planning. Um, because there are so many complex needs that these families have, and we really need to support them through this process of intensive case management and coordinated case planning. Um, Judge Garo, do you want to go ahead and talk about some of these? Thanks. Sure. So, so one of the things I learned as I started um, doing some reading about uh, case management and what it means, and when now we have a case manager, is... I didn't realize uh, it, it's quite a skill. Um, and I think because from the outside, from the judge's perspective, you're like, well, did you just follow up with this person? But that's not what's going on. You're, you're, there's a definite ways and different methods and, and how you build a relationship with that person and, and build trust. Um, and, and it's so important. And I know a lot of our healing wellness courts don't have the funds to have just one, you know, case manager, and sometimes you all kind of do it together, um, and, and that's okay. Uh, communication is the key that everybody knows what everybody is, is doing. Um, that's why you all need to be in the pre-staffing uh, or pre-hearing meeting. Um, so you have that coordinated case planning, and, and one of the best examples I've seen of that is uh, uh, um, Gila River, where Judge uh, uh, the judge there, um, they revamped their family treatment court to make sure that the court's case and milestones matched what was going on in their division of social services. And we're getting ready to uh, hopefully hear our own in the court, our child neglect cases. So we'll be referring people to our own family treatment court. And, and so that's one of my focuses is to make sure it's coordinated. Um, and um, we work very hard, our case manager and our coordinator, uh, doing warm handoffs when you have to send a, a person to a new place if they've never been there before to make sure that they know they know how to do it um, and sometimes you know even helping them you know we don't do it for them but well sometimes if they struggle with it for a couple weeks and just the the text messages prompts don't work then then maybe we'll we'll do a little bit more but um but coordinating that and making sure that you know the person the parents who already have a lot in their plates are not jumping through 10 different hoops, just trying to please everybody that, because I think one of the, the benefits of doing intensive case management and it's coordinated is that they're actually then engaged in their treatment and they're not just, well, okay, I got this sheet of five things to do and I check it off and I've got this sheet for this program and I just check it off, but rather you're, you're focusing on the issues. So, Judge Forsyth? So some courts might have a coordinator and case manager. Some courts, it's a one person doing both. And so that's the case with us. Our coordinator, she is working on the weekly stuff that we want the clients to participate in, but she's also doing the daily case management. And looking at the planning portion of it, taking into consideration what are they doing for social services? Maybe they're on probation. 
looking at all of the team members and getting them to give the information to the coordinator or case manager to implement that into their weekly task sheet has made it uh, more of a one-stop shop. And so asking the client when you're doing the assessment, what, what other programs are you involved in, would be helpful to know everything up front. So maybe that program would say, okay, well, we'll get the update from you. And now they don't feel like they're doing double, triple work for other programs. And on number D, the high quality parenting time. So the visitation with the parents and children, um, it's a struggle sometimes because of social services is case managing a lot of cases on their own. And we, as the judges, not only for the, the wellness courts, but also for the family courts, we want those visitations to happen because it, it's very important for the parent to stay motivated, but also for the child to have that bonding and not losing that. So if, if you are a family-centered treatment court, make sure that visitation is upfront one of the most uh, important scheduled things with all the team members and that it's being uh, on a consistent basis and that if it's falling short that it's brought to the attention of the judge and all of the other team members as well. Next slide. Standard seven is therapeutic responses to behavior. Despite being a voluntary opportunity for parents and families to participate in the family treatment court. We know that their behaviors are not always going to align with just moving straight forward. In fact, if people are going through the family treatment court perfectly, they might not be the appropriate fit for being in part, a part of this initiative at all. And so we have as family treatment court teams, therapeutic responses to these behavior in our tool belt of ways to modify behaviors for our parents. We need to take a number of things into account though as we respond to these behaviors. We need to make sure that they are trauma informed and we need to make sure that they are responding to the why behind behavior. Oftentimes listening to our parent and including parent voice in decisions as well as including the rest of the team and the, per and the, the other participants that on the team that know a little bit about the background, understand what led to a behavior, um, can help to inform the judge and be able to come up with the best response possible. Um, it is the entire team op opportunity for them to share and discuss responses, but ultimately it comes down to the judge and their decision in what that response will be. And this of course means different responses as well as incentives. And we know that we want to make sure that we have more incentives, making sure to highlight the positives of what parents are doing, using that positive reinforcement to really encourage those positive behaviors. Um, and then we also just want to make sure that we take into account the impact on children and on the entire family when we make responses. Um, one study showed that, uh, I think by Jefferson County, um, looked at all the families that they had ever had jail used as a sanction, and they found that they had zero positive outcomes for those families. And so they looked to just completely remove jail as a possibility, as a sanction. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways to kind of measure and take into account what we're, what we're looking at as those therapeutic responses. Next slide, please. And I'll go ahead and open it up. I think we're gonna start with Judge Four Star. So therapeutic responses to behavior, a lot of what we have struggled with is the incentives and sanctions. And as a lot of courts are probably in the same situation is there's not a lot of funding available for the incentives. So it's not always something tangible that you're looking for. Praise can be at low cost, no cost, and there are resources for that but also going out into your communities and, and asking for donations. Some courts have done that as well. And uh, Will had just mentioned some courts have taken jail out of the sanction. Um, we were heavily sanctioning jail time at the beginning, um, pre-COVID, after COVID. Uh, we haven't done any jail sanctions, but we've done community service sanctions. And one of the, the core of putting the clients and the participants back into the communities is that rehabilitation factor. So even though something may look like a sanction, it may also be an incentive because you're putting them back out into the community 
to if it's attending, helping at a local function or a ceremony or putting them in an environment that they wouldn't normally be in, they might find it enjoyable. So the sanction and the incentive, it could go hand in hand. And for participants to be heard, this is one of the, uh, the most important things that we have found when clients, they, they just want to say their piece, um, whether it's in court or to the coordinator or case manager, uh, it's very important for the participants to feel like they have a voice and that they're being heard. Whether it's something you can respond to or not, they just want you to be a listener. And maintaining that professional demeanor, as you'll see some of your participants, they if they came in, they, don't, they didn't have a good day that day, it may affect the other clients and, and they will feed off of each other as Judge Garrow had said, this does happen and be able to step in, maintaining that professional demeanor with everybody, the team members, the clients, and how they see you reacting to each other is going to set the tone. Judge Garrow? So I just wanted to 100% agree with everything Judge Farstar said. Um, so, so we don't have jail as an option, but our participants in, in county family court, they often get sanctioned to jail. Um, and so we see the um, one, it makes us not the bad guy, which is kind of nice. Um, but two, we've seen that it does, does not work. Um, and unfortunately they often are uh, sanctioned for longer periods of time than they should be. And we have not yet had a person be successful who ends up uh, spending a lengthy amount of time in jail because then they're just frustrated and angry and give up. Um, we So we're, we've are we had to be really creative, which I think requires us to focus more on, on therapeutic responses and, and why are they doing this? Um, and we try really hard not to sanction, just to sanction. Um, a lot of times we just give people a warning, you know, if it's something small. Um, you know, didn't get in all their meetings and, um, uh, uh, but we do, we use a lot of essays, uh, and, and we make them read them in court, uh, pre pandemic when they actually had to be in court, physically in court, uh, we discovered our participants did not like that. Um, and so we found that a very effective sanction. A lot of them, you know, probably didn't have to do things like that. And it made them very nervous. Um, and then we would praise them for actually doing something they weren't used to and, and that they did a really good job. Um, and we'd ask them questions about it. Um, and so we found that that's a really effective uh, a sanction. We will also, depending on what the, the, the behavior is, we also use a lot of um, perhaps uh, increasing check-ins um, uh, or sometimes uh, requiring them if they in a phase where they're not coming to court every week, having them come uh, into court. I found during the pandemic, it's very effective to having them to check in more. Uh, and a lot of times I, I tell them, you know, this is not really a punishment. It's just because we're concerned that you're not doing the things you're supposed to, or we've had some some of our moms struggling with anxiety and depression and, and you know, we can just hear in their voices, they're not doing well. Um, and then they're not engaging with meetings and things like that. So we just have them check in more and just want to echo uh, the importance of having a professional demeanor and giving the participants uh, participants an opportunity to be heard. Um, uh, and, and I always give the participants first chance. You know, I always know when they've done something maybe they shouldn't have, you know, so usually my discussion opens up, well, how was your week? And that's their opportunity to say, well, this didn't go right, or I missed this. And, and sometimes they don't say, and then, then I will bring it up. Um, and, and, and sometimes they're surprised that I know sometimes they're not. But we try to very hard, we call it the sandwich approach, which I'm sure we've learned from someone else. We start with a, a, um, a compliment. We try to find something, even if they've had a really bad week. They showed up. They showed up to court. Uh, and then we'll focus on something that they need to correct. And then we try to conclude with a, a compliment and, and end on a good note um, uh, that, that they're, we know they're working hard and they're trying. So I think that goes a long way um, as you're, you're giving sanctions and um, that, that professional demeanor that they know that you care. And I always try to remind our participants that you're important to us, you're important to the community. Um, and so that's why we're asking you to do all these things so you can contribute.
Next slide, please. And one more. All right, our final best practice standard is monitoring and evaluation. I imagine that everyone listening to our presentation is either really excited to hear about this or ready for this presentation to end. Um, but the truth is, is that data evaluation, looking at what you're doing and how it's, how it's effective is so important. It gives us the uh, opportunity to do some continuous quality uh, improvement and make modification to our practices and understand what we're doing that is working and what we're doing that needs some improvement. Um, so it's, it's very important that we make sure that we're evaluating our outcomes, comparing, again, our family treatment court outcomes to the system as a whole. If our outcomes in our family treatment court are not as, um, as good or as our regular track or our regular child welfare cases, we need to really look at understanding why that might be. Do we expect perfect parenting versus safe parenting or what other kind of challenges might be occurring that we are able to then look at. Um, and then again, our evaluation is able to really tell a story of what our family treatment court is doing, our successes, the needs that we have, and then looking at some of those practices. We talked about jail a little bit. We talked about incentives and other sanctions, um, what is working and what isn't working. So this monitoring and evaluation piece really gives us the tools to be able to make sure that we're offering the best services to the families and, and really moving to help families reunify. Next slide, please. And we'll start with Judge Garrow. All right. So, um, so we're a small court and we, we keep our, our data right now, um, probably like a lot of you do, our coordinator keeps a lot of it in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, but we're actually transitioning to a database that will allow us a court management database that will allow us to keep better i don't want to say better actually maybe more easily accessible data where we can run reports uh, much quicker um, and i think that that's important um, to help us figure out what we're doing um, and how to make improvements um, as a as a team, we try. Uh, obviously, we haven't done it since COVID, um, but we try to meet once a year to go over our policies and procedures um, and to figure out, you know, what are the things that we need to work on. Feel how the team is doing. We do a little team building. Uh, of course, we have a meal together, and I think that helps us to maintain what we're doing. Check in on ourselves. Is there anything that people are unhappy about or uncomfortable with, or want us to change um, because what we've learned out of training. Um, and, and I always encourage our team members to, to keep track of the best practices and also in their areas, what they're learning, what they're learning in mental health, which changes as well and what they're learning, uh, you know, our treatment providers are learning and the things they're, they're changing. And, you know, now they're, well, pre-pandemic, they were training uh, uh, peer mentors, which we hadn't had before. And so maybe once the pandemic is over, uh, we'll, we'll have um, uh, uh, things of, of those nature for our families. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Judge Forstar. So maintaining that data electronically, this is one of the areas where we didn't have this at the very beginning. And throughout the process, there was a lot of paper. And so we we have a CMS, we have a case management system, but it wasn't effective for what we were doing with the wellness court. So we did invest in, in DIMS and there are other programs out there such as that where you can uh, monitor the clients. But what we also invested in was a uh, drug testing program that was web-based and that has helped us um, reduce the paper, but also helps us to run reports to see things in a snapshot but maintaining that data electronically has also given us the tools that we need when we're applying for grants and we're looking at the numbers games and uh, figuring out how much we are really inputting. When you see it in a snapshot like that, you realize how much work is going into your wellness courts, but also into your participants and engaging that process of continuous quality improvement. And that's what you're doing today by 
attending this week's conference, but that quality improvement, maybe you want to set aside a time if it's once a month, once a quarter, and having a team meeting and um, team building and focusing on what's working, what isn't working, is there a new program available, a new resource, and bringing in those best practices as a refresher. Those are That is always helpful because when you get caught up in the day-to-day -day activities and you're putting out fires and you're working on the clients with their task sheets and what, what they have in their phases, sometimes that goes to the back of your mind. So bringing those forward will give you a refresher and help you feel like you're implementing something new, but it's already been there. Next slide. Thanks so much. So we, as you could tell, we couldn't even begin to touch all of the provisions um, in the standards. So as you, as you do what Will suggested, print those standards out and then reference them as you have questions, you will slowly kind of become familiar and, and be able to turn to them. Um, but also turn to each other as we've been going through this presentation today, folks have been, um, engaging in the chat, asking and answering each other's questions. Um, and as we um, sort of, we've got a few minutes here. Um, one of the questions that came up judges was when you're in um, stat, when you're in the court hearings, um, what is your practice in terms of uh, talking with the participants? Um, is it just you or is it the team? The research tells us that we need the judge to spend at least three minutes in family healing to wellness courts. It's usually needing to be a little bit more time because we've got a lot to talk about, including what's happening with the children and parenting time. Um, but, um, and that, that they not um, monologue as, as Judge Garrow said. Um, so how do you manage that in terms of it? Is it just you and the participant or is, do you, does the team also engage? This is Judge Farstar. For us, it is the judge talking and we do provide the team and normally we staff an hour before we go into court. So if there is something that another staff member wants to bring up, they will let us know at that time. So depending on how many clients you have and how much time you have is going to determine how much time you can spend with each client. And being able to, in advance, um, put the time limit in front of them without telling them that they have a time limit so they don't feel rushed and giving a specific topic. And like Judge Garrow said, if you're asking, you know, how was your day or how was your week, you may get a response that's beyond that time limit. So be prepared of how you're going to handle that, even if you have to interrupt and move on to the next client. But the other thing we do is we do make appointments for them. If they need to come in to talk to the LAC for a one-on-one -on -one session where they can talk at length more about what it is that they wanted to bring up, or if they don't want to bring it up in front of everybody, then they can tell us that. We tell them they can tell us that so we can make a uh, more private appointment with them with some of the team members. Thanks. So our, um, I, I always um, start off, um, I spend the majority, I take the majority of the time. Um, I generally um, will ask the team when I'm finished, if they have anything they wanna share. Uh, so, because sometimes I'll forget something, <laughs> despite my chicken scratch. Um, but they, I also, for us, uh, I, well, I guess I should say for me, I've never asked the team how they feel about it. Um, but I, I like it because a lot of times they will um, confirm something I've said, or they'll say it in a different way. So the participant hears it again. Or a lot of the time, it's just, um, hey, good job this week. Um, or, you know, yeah, you know, you need to work on this, but you're doing a good job. And, um, and so uh, I, I, I really like having, the team and it's totally optional um usually at least one person says something um uh you know or they might remind them to do something or come up with a you know a different service maybe the participant has raised an issue 
um, a lot of time it's also acknowledging, you know, how many days they've been sober. And, and I think it, it just, for us, it, it creates uh, an, a, a maybe even, a, you know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, where, where um, the participants feel very supported. They're not just talking to the judge. Thank you. There's some other questions in the chat. Um, what we will do is we will promise to follow up directly with you um, and get those responses to you. I also um, want to, we've been dropping uh, resources into the chat. We will have a resource page that will be uploaded to this site. And if you could go to the next slide, please. We want to highlight a, whoop, highlight a couple of uh, resources for you. Again, this is the link to the Family Treatment Court Best Practice Standards. Um, next. We have available peer learning courts. Um, we are all in a process of continuous quality improvement. We're all in a learning journey together in these treatment courts. Um, but these uh, eight family treatment courts um, have, have particular strengths. Um, they are available to you as resources, as mentor courts. Um, and if you are interested, if there's one close to you or you have a particular question, please email us and we will um, connect you with that peer learning court and um, you can do an observation, ask for their resources um, or have a one-on-one -on -one or a, a team discussion. Next. Um, we've dropped several of these in here. These are our Practice Academy courses for this year, 2021. Each of these has both, has a video, a, a educational video. It has a discussion guide, a take action guide, and a live conversation. Our next one is Disrupting Stigma to Support Meaningful Change for Families in a Family Treatment Court. That video will be available soon and the live conversation on July 8th. Next. These are contact, um, contact links for each of the four of us. Please do reach out and uh, Will and, and other staff at Children and Family Futures will be in touch with you about any of the questions that you've had. Um, Chris? So, Thank you for attending today's family track workshop entitled Family Treatment Court, Family Treatment Courts, Best Practice Standards Through the Eyes of the Healing to Wellness Courts, Practice Application of the Standards. Recordings will be posted on this platform and will remain up until July 30th. After this time, you may find recordings at enhancementtraining.org. Don't forget. Marlin is dropping the evaluation link in the chat link. So please take some time and fill out an evaluation for this session. We truly appreciate it. And thank you once again to our presenters, our partners at CFF and our judges. Thank you very much.